First, going to start off with a, a, an indicator from Futures IO, or if any of you have been around long enough from Big Mike's. <laughs> so, custom indicator here, M A H bar E T. So it's a bar timer indicator. So we'll kind of we'll kind of cover this here. Uh, this is our indicator here that we're gonna uh, work with for a little bit. Um, so let's see. I don't have the actual question that was asked about this indicator, so I'll just kind of cover the, uh, I guess, various uh, solvers and I guess wh whatever I can come up with, uh, you know, that we can do with with this indicator, right? So, um, so if you want to know the time that a bar um, that a that a bar what is, what's the right way of saying this if you want to know the time span of a bar that's what this indicator does right it measures the time span of a bar uh, in seconds so um, let's see let's let me open up the uh, indicator settings so it's got uh, a max, max bar time I don't know why uh, it's got a period so um, they're adding a, a moving average to the bar time, so you can get a moving average of the bar time, um, right? So there's an average plot, and then there's a time plot. So there we go. So I guess that's the period for the average. So I don't, I don't know much more about this indicator than just that. Um, let's see, number of bars. You, it doesn't even say what type of average it is so I have no idea I just yeah I'm, I'm sure you can get more information from the uh, uh, download page on futures IO exactly what um, you know more detail about what this indicator is and how to use it and whatnot so but uh, I'll just gonna show you know some various solvers and things that we can do with it um, so let's see. All right, let's get Bloodhound open here. So I'm going to start working on the logic tab. It's going to switch over to the logic tab here and start a new logic template. And let's give this a name. And I guess I'll just, just use this as my name. Paste that in there. There we go. There you go. Just throw testing on there just for good measure. Um, all right, let's see. Um, a simple thing we can do with this indicator um, is let's use a threshold solver. So let's say, for example, you want to identify any bar um, that's greater than 60 seconds. So let's see here. Um, there's a red line here, and let me open this up again. Um, yeah, there we go. So this right, this indicator has has a line um, called a threshold uh, set to 60. So I'm assuming that means that's going to be 60 seconds. Um, right here, I'll make this line a little thicker. We'll make it dashed. That way it'll show up a little better. There we go. So, you know, let's say we're using this indicator and we're setting this threshold to whatever is needed, you know, so we can identify uh, um, whenever the bar takes more than 60 seconds. Uh, and so in Bloodhound, we can identify whenever a bar takes longer than 60 seconds as well by using a threshold solver. All right, so I'm going to connect this solver up to the result node there. Um, I'll give this a name. There we go. So next step, uh, let's plug the indicator in here. It's down here in the M's. There it is. All right. Um, now I'm just using the default settings here. You know, of 120 and a period of nine. 
So I don't need to do anything. Now I need to decide what plots do I choose, right? We have two plots here. Um, and so, um, let's see, uh, we're checking the, the bar time plot. So I think using the time plot sounds, looks like the, the correct one, right? The average is, um, it would be this um, average line, this average of the bar times. So, all right, so we'll keep it on the uh, time plot here that's already selected for us. So we're nothing to do, just click OK. And then next, um, let's put the uh, threshold that we're looking for in there. So put 60 in there. And so this is a bar time timer. So obviously, uh, you know, time has no direction. It doesn't time doesn't tell you to go long or short. So our output from this type of indicator, in general, should be both long output and we want a short output at the same time all right um, and that's because it's non-directional again and let's stretch this up here all right so you see how uh, bloodhound kind of has this analog output here and this analog look yeah you know because it's it's basically bloodhound is kind of matching the bar time here and you'll notice that whenever we have these black candles or yeah black bars or black candles uh those black candles seem to be when the when the uh when the bar is above that red threshold line and you'll notice that bloodhounds uh racing stripes also uh correlate with these black bars so yeah so it looks like the indicator will change um the uh, bar to black when it's at that threshold level of 60 seconds. So, um, yeah. Now, uh, most people don't use Bloodhound's kind of fuzzy logic output here, right? This this um, varying type of out output, this analog output. So if we want to get rid of that, what we can do is we can put 60 in our thresholds twice. We'll put 60 in there twice. And now we can see Bloodhound has a much cleaner outlook output and um, and it's still identifying all of the black bars here. All right. um, so yeah, so any bar that um, takes longer than 60 seconds to build is being marked right now. So, and let's see here. This is actually so it's greater than sixty seconds. All right. So there's that one, and um, so let's let's make one. Let's make a solver that identifies bars that say um, take less than 10 seconds like a really fast bar All right. um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a copy of this solver so I switched over to the solver tab here and I'm gonna click on this solver and I'm gonna use the copy button uh, to make a copy of that and change the name here so this is going to find bars that are less than 10 seconds <clears throat> all right so I'm just going to change the name now and then I'm going to switch back over to our logic board and go to existing nodes and there's that new solver I just made it says um, and ooh, it's greater than 10 seconds. Let me fix the name here. Fix that name. There we go. Less than 10 seconds. All right. So if I want to find a bar that's less than 10 seconds, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm gonna, I just got to rework my thresholds here a little bit. 
So I'm going to put 11 in there and then put 10 in there. Um, so there we go. So we got 0 seconds, 10 seconds, and 11 seconds in my thresholds there. Right? So A, B, and C. And now I need to adjust my, my outputs. So if you read the output, it says greater than 11. And it has, a, you know, and it's set to 1. So right now, if you look at the chart, we're identifying bars that are greater than 11 seconds. Uh, but I'm wanting to identify bars that are 10 seconds or less. So this greater than 11, you know, we don't want bars that are, that have a time greater than 11 seconds. So I'm going to set that to zero. I'm going to turn those off. Turn both those off. So what we do want is a bar that could be at 10 seconds um, and also could be at zero seconds as well. And if we look at the output here, you can see we're identifying uh, bars here that have a really short, short uh, time span there. And so, remember, this is a non, so the time of a bar is non-directional, doesn't tell you what direction, you know, so we know, we, you know, so it doesn't mean we want to trade long only if we have a short bar. So I'm going to turn on the short side as well. So we get a short output. So. All right, so um, you know, so this indicator definitely uh, is just a component of part of a system, right? So you'll need to have um, other kind of other trading rules to go along uh, with this bar timer. Other you know trading, uh, yeah, tra other trading rules, um, you know, uh, uh, some other kind of trading methodology that will tell you what direction to take it to uh, trade in right so so this bar timer again it's just a uh, would just be a, a component of someone's trading system so so if um, I don't know maybe if you're into scalping scalp trading you know you might want to identify when these fast bars happen um, you know it's kind of a pre setup to jump into a scalp trade and so this solver would be would help you do that right so right now we're marking all the bars that are 10 seconds or less and we're getting a long and a short output because the rest of your trading rules um well actually no, I, mean, no I, I won't state it that way so we're getting a long and a short output be, because this bar time you want it to allow for either a long trade or a short trade right and so the you know the rest of your logic would filter out whether it's going to be a long trade or a short trade so um let's see what else can we do here um let's take a look at the uh the slope um of the average let's say you want to know whether the time of the bars is increasing, right? Cause that, that can tell you that there's uh, some consolidation going on in the market. So if the, if the blue average line, uh, hopefully you guys can see that blue average line underneath the uh, bars there. So if that blue average line is rising, um, you know, that tells you that the, the time span of the bars is getting longer and longer. And usually that indicates that there's some consolidation going on. Um, so, um, or there's maybe there's resistance going on. So, um, so let's take a look at that. So let's we'll, we'll use the slope solver for this. So let me copy that name. All right. So let's see. Uh, time is increasing here all right and let's go plug our indicator in there we go all right and again I'm just using the default settings for this indicator um, uh, so now we want to use the average plot right 
So let's select the average plot here. And all right, if we look at Bloodhound's output, let's kind of stretch this out a little bit. So whenever the blue average line is sloping down, Bloodhound's giving us a short, whenever that average line is sloping up, we're getting a long output, but you know, all we want to identify is just when that average line is sloping up, telling us that the timing of the bars, the time span of the bars is getting longer and longer and longer. So um, we're going to have to uh, adjust some outputs here. Let's see. Um, actually, we're going to have to we're gonna to have to use a function node. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this to long only. So you see this evaluate long only. So you notice how the, the short output now is gone and all we're left with is just the long output, all right? So we can see we have a long output whenever this average, blue average line is increasing. And you know, again, this bar time is non-directional. Just because the bar time is increasing doesn't mean we should be taking a long trade here. So I need to take this long output and also add a short output to it at the same time. All right, let's let's go. Let's see if um, yeah, here we go. So we can see um, just to make my point. Right, we have a a bit of a a downtrend here, and. Let me change the color. Right, we have a downtrend, um, and the bar time is increasing. So that doesn't mean we should be taking longs in a downtrend, right? So therefore, we want to add a uh, a long output to the short output at the same time. So way I can do that is. I can grab a long short modifier, this function node here. So this long short modifier is built so that we can um, modify the output of a solver. Uh, so you see right now the default mode is in swap and you notice how everything reversed to a short output now, right? It went from a long output to a short output. But what we want to do is let's mirror the long side here. So we're getting a long, this, our solver is giving us a long output. So we can just mirror this output and get to get a short output at the same time. Okay. So we're set on road to mirror long. So, and I'll change the name of this function node so we know what it's, oh, shoot, accidentally clicked on, hit the little X there, I hit the little cancel. There we go. All right, all set up nice and neat there. So uh, there we go, so now, um, now we have a, a uh, set of nodes here uh, that will identify when the bar time is starting to increase. Um, and let's, um, let's do the same. So uh, for, let's do the same thing for when the, the bar time is decreasing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the slope solver and I need to make a copy of it. So just as we had copied the threshold solver earlier, I'm going to take this slope solver and make a copy of it. And so this time we're going to identify when the time decreases. And what we'll do is 
we're going to change our outputs to do that. So instead of instead of identifying um, the let's see. Uh, Let's see. Oh, yeah. The only thing I need to do is switch over to my short only. Switch my evaluate to short only. And yeah, we're going to keep everything the same. So now I'm switched back over to my logic board. And let's go find that slope solver I just made. There we go. Time decrease. Let's take this down here. Let's take a look at it. Take a look at the solver. And um, yeah, so you'll notice when whenever um, let me grab myself a little arrow. So whenever the average line starts to drop, decrease, right? So it's sloping down now. And so we're right, so our our slope solver is gonna give us a short output whenever a you know whenever a line starts to slope down. Alright, and so now we can just grab another long short modifier. And this time we'll mirror the short side. We'll get it, get it named, and uh, there. Now, so we're all done. There we go. Um, so now we can see whenever, yeah, whenever that average line is sloping down or decreasing, right? That's telling us that the average bar time is getting shorter and shorter. And I don't know, maybe that's handy for scalpers to know when. You know, uh, bars are forming very quickly. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that might play into someone's methodology, but uh, definitely played into one of our customers that was asking how to how to use this indicator, or at least how to use it in Bloodhound. Um, all right, let's see what let me let me see what else I can come up with here okay here's one we can um, identify bars that are greater than the average than the bar time average right so you notice how we get some of these bars uh, are sticking above the average line right so we have a bunch of bars here that are below the average line and then every once in a while we get some bars that are above the average line so let's let's do that. Um, and so that is a comparison. So we're comparing the height of the bar to the value of the average line. So let's see, let me let's um, come up with a name here. Um, So let's see, it should be time is greater than the average. <clears throat> All right, so let's see, the first thing we're going to need to put in here is. Um, there's our indicator. Yeah, the first thing we want to we want to analyze is the time, right? So we're we're checking to see is is the time which the the bars, the bar plot, is the time of the bar. So we're going to compare that to the average. So for input B, we're going to put the average in here, uh, right? Input A. Input A has the bar time. Input B is going to have the average of the time. Okay. 
Here we go, selected the indicator again. So this time we need to select the average plot. Select that like that there. Oh, and let's connect that in. And so now we need to adjust our outputs here. All right, we have a bunch of outputs here. So let's look at the board and let's figure out what, you know, which output uh, is correct for us. So we can see here all, all of the bar times are way below the average line right here. And we're getting a short output. And whenever the bar time is greater than the average line, like we have here, a bunch of these, we're getting a long output. All right. So if we go back to the solver here, so you see it's, this says long output. So we want to keep the long output, that's correct. But the short output down here, you'll notice, all right, it has the opposite settings here. So let's turn these off and let's match what the long output has. Like so, all right, so the long output where we have a one set, we take the short output and we match it just like so. And there, there we have it. Again, we have a long and a short output whenever the bar time is greater than the average bar time. So if you guys have recognized a theme here, all of these solvers are gonna create an output that's long and short. Because again, all of these kind of conditions that I'm coming up with, um, you know, they're all non-directional conditions because they're all based on time, right? We're just looking at time of a bar and that's always a non-directional uh, type of condition here. So, all right. So uh, one last thing, let's, um, let's, let's build a solver that does the opposite. Let's, let's find bars that have a very short time a time that's less than the average time. All right. So they're actually uh, with this solver. There is one thing we can do that would make this very quick. We could just use, take the invert output and uh, turn that on. We could just quickly invert this, and uh, you'll notice, boom, bingo. There we go. Um, now we're identifying right bars that. Um, bar times that are less than the average bar time. Okay. So we could just do that, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and build a new solver here. So let's go back to our solver tab again, and let's make a copy of this. And so this time, the time is gonna be less than the average. So we'll change that name there. And um, simply what we need to do is reverse our outputs here. All right, so you notice I'm going to go through the outputs and just reverse them all. all right, so instead of, instead of using the A greater than B output, we're now using the A less than B. All right, A is less than B. So remember, A, A is time. B is the average time. So we're looking for time to be less than the average time. All right, let's switch back to our logic board and let's put this new solver on there. And let's take a look. Yeah, there we go. So any bar, any, any bar time that's less than the average is now being marked. All right, well, I think that's about as much as uh, we can do with this indicator. Um, yeah. All right, so let me uh, pause for a moment and take a look at the question board and see if there's any questions on on this topic here before I move on to some other questions, all right? I got a quick question here. Gary's asking, does this indicator work on tick charts? 
Um, I would imagine this indicator works on all charts. Um, so let's see, this is NQ. Uh, so let's try a 250 tick chart. And there we go, 250 tick chart. And it is definitely working. Uh, looks like 250 tick charts uh, usually take quite a while to build, so maybe I should knock that down to 125 tick. There we go. Now we got some faster moving bars. So there we go, tick chart. Um, yeah. You know, it, in in my experience, there are very, very, very few indicators that can only work on certain charts. Most indicators can work on any chart. Uh, it's, it's very seldom that a programmer would know how to write an indicator that can only work on certain charts. So. All right, can you use Raven for SIM trading? Uh, yes. We don't, um, we don't place any account restrictions on our strategies. So let's uh, let's open this up here. So right, so Raven is a strategy. So let's go into our strategies. So there's Raven, <clears throat> and so we can see here you can you can put Raven on. Uh, well, actually, Ninja Trader defaults all strategies to the Sim account. All right, so. Ninja Trader will, so yeah, just be aware of that, guys. If you ever do want to use a strategy such as Raven or Blackbird to start trading live money, you'll always have to go in here and change your account from Sim to your live account, right? Because um, uh, Ninja Trader always uh, always s defaults a strategy to the Sim account, right? It's just a little safety. Right, a little uh, safety factor there, um, right? Uh, you, you never want, you never, you never want um, a strategy to, you know, easily start trading live money, right? You always want to make sure that you're intentionally setting your strategy up to trade live money there. So, all right, so yeah, so when you want to trade live money, you'll always have to change it from SIM to your live account there. Is there a way to determine how many bars uh, these the slope of an indicator has been I guess increasing or decreasing so yeah let's take a look at that <clears throat> all right let's just grab a EMA let's see I have an EMA 20 there <clears throat> all right here we go the red line EMA 20 so let's say um, you know for example let's see Kind of looks like uh, let's let me grab a dot here. Kind of looks like right there is about about the bar where the EMA starts to slope up. So let's say we want to know when that EMA has been sloping up for at least ten bars, um, or sloping down for at least ten bars. So let's go. Let's get Bloodhound open. Let's go to the logic uh, tab there, and I'm going to start a new logic template, and let's see, let's call this, um, <clears throat> sloping for x, uh, um, for x bars, yeah. All right, there we go. Slo sloping for x number of bars. Okay, so let's grab a slope solver, and we'll plug that in. And let's just get this slope solver set up. So we're we're looking at an EMA twenty <clears throat> in this, and let's go grab our EMA. Let's change it to a 20 period.
All right. Um, there we go. So simply put, um, slope solver is telling us when that EMA is sloping down or sloping up. So definitely doing a lot of sloping up as the market uh, and queues uh, rising here. Okay, now to identify um, X number of bars in that slope, we're going to use a function node and let's we're going to use the look back node so what we're going to do is we're going to look back in time and look back you know on the bars that had gone by and you know and start looking at the historical bars in the past so let's grab this look back now we want to set our displacement to zero we don't need a displacement but uh, and then the look back period let's set that to 10 so that'll look back 10 bars, right? A period of 10 means we're going to look back 10 bars, right? Same thing with the your like your moving average period, right? So an EMA 20 period means the EMA formula is looking back 20 bars, right? A period means how many bars back do you look? So we're going to look back 10 bars, and what we want to set the mode to is minimum. <clears throat> So, okay, the minimum means this, this mode is actually looking at the solver's output. So it's taking the solver's output, um, and we're looking for the minimum value. As we look back 10 bar, we're looking for the minimum value here. So what that does is, you know, when we start here, so let, let, uh, let's see, let's make, make a little more sense. Okay, let's say, right, this, this is our, our current bar here. Let me grab another arrow. Okay, so let's pretend that's our current bar. And so the look back node, it's going to look back 10 bars and it's going to find the minimum value as it looks back. All right, so it's looking back 10 bars, and when it gets to this down slope, right, right here where, where the uh, EMA is sloping down, there's no long output, right? The EMA is sloping down, so there's no long output, and it has a short output. So the long output is zero in this area where the EMA is sloping down. So when we look back 10 bars, we're finding a few bars that have a, a zero output for the long side and so therefore um, therefore the output is going to be set to zero right because we're looking for the minimum value coming out of this um, slope solver here so and so once yeah once we get to the tenth to the tenth bar that has a long output. All right, so here let's take a let's take a look at the slope solver. And all of my colors are set up for black charts. So there we go. So you know, so what I'm circling here is that. <coughs> We need 10 long outputs here. Um, whenever we get to this area, right, whenever we get here, there's, there's no long output. And so if we're looking for the minimum value, then whenever we get to an area that has no long output, um, then the look back node is going to return the minimum value. So if it finds a zero for the long output, it's going to return zero out of the look back. All right. So that's kind of the short answer here. There, there are, there is a video specific to the look back node that kind of explains how the look back node uh, operates in, in more detail here. So I can pull those, I can 
find that video for you if you want me to. Um, um, I'll just do a I'll just do a search on YouTube for that video. Um, but in any case, the you know the short version is <clears throat> if we want to find you know if we want to if we want to identify that the slope has been up or down for a a minimum of 10 bars then that this is how we do it so and let's see here let's take a look at the original solver and yeah you know, you'll notice we had one one bar there that where the EMA sloped down and so that kind of reset everything restarted the count over again so there we, there we go so there's our little red arrow and then we had to wait for another 10 bars of uh, sloping up there another little simple question about the slope solver so you'll notice here that one of the outputs uh, let me stretch this out a little bit there we go All right so one of the outputs says value at zero slope um, right, so the slope solver um, identifies, uh, you know, when when a plot is sloping up or sloping down. But what if it's flat? Well, if it's flat, that that is no slope, right? So a slope of zero is a flat slope, and so therefore there's no output. Let's see if I could find one. Um, uh, it's pretty. The EMA typically does not have a zero slope that often. Um, let's see. Actually, let me change my bars. That might help. So I'm just scanning through the chart here real quickly. I'm trying to find a a zero slope on that EMA, and I'm not finding one. Uh, all right. Let's try. <clears throat> We try something else. All right, yeah, the SMA typically has a lot, a uh, lot more zero sloping areas here. So uh, SMA fourteen <laughs> slope. So right, so our, our our indicator here is set to the SMA fourteen, and. You'll notice there's some areas, a couple of bars where there's no output, and that's because the the slope is perfectly flat, a zero slope for the SMA14. <clears throat> um, and so let's say maybe you're looking for a flat slope. Then we can turn this output on, and I can turn the others off, and bingo. Now I can identify. There we go. There's actually three spots here. There. There's three spots <clears throat> where that SMA 14 is perfectly flat. So I guess I should put the SMA on the chart. Order filled. There we go. So the blue line is the SMA. And if you stretch things way, way out, you'd be able to see that the SMA is perfectly flat. So. There we go. So let's rename this solver here and so because it's finding a flat slope so we have our value at <clears throat> slope zero set to one and we have all the other outputs turned off <clears throat> all right so we want to identify when the open price of the bar is a minimum of two ticks away and a maximum of 10 ticks away from an ema 20. okay let's do that let me make a new logic template here. Um, let's see. All right, so we're going to check <clears throat> for when the open is a maximum of 10 ticks away 
and a minimum of two ticks away from an EMA 20. And let's see, just so happens we have an EMA 20 on the chart. So let me uh, slim down our SMA on the chart. There we go. All right, let's get Bloodhound back open. And there's our logic template. All right, so we're going to use a couple of comparison solvers to do this. So we're going to use one comparison solver that's going to identify when the open is a maximum of 10 ticks away. So in other words, when the open price is within 10 ticks of the EMA 20. So, uh, all right, so for our slope solver here, <clears throat> the first thing we're, right, we're comparing price to an indicator. So input A is gonna be price. So we're gonna set that to price. And we're gonna, and we're looking at the open price. So let's change both of these prices to the open. And our distance is 10 ticks. Put 10 ticks in there. And we're comparing the open to the EMA. So let's change our indicator to the EMA. There's our EMA and let's put a 20 period in. like so and now we need to adjust our outputs here uh, correctly <clears throat> let's see so <clears throat> um, so what we're going to use is the a equals b within so right uh, just so you guys know, this text uh, will um, this text will auto update. So you see how right now the text all all says zero ticks, zero ticks, zero ticks. So if I click off and if I click back on, sometimes some machines you have to click on and off, and then you can see you can get this uh, text to, to update. So some machines, the text will update automatically. Other machines, it won't. I don't know why. It's some kind of weird little Windows thing. Uh, so, but anyway, so now you can see the text is A equals B within 10 ticks. And that's what we want. So let's set that. There we go. Okay. So now we've identified whenever the open of the bar is within 10 ticks of our red EMA. Like so. Yeah, we can see whenever the bars move, you know, uh, move more than 10 ticks away, uh, the uh, our output goes to zero there. All right, this looks like a good place to work with on the chart. Yeah, so in these areas where price is really uh, moving away, we can see there's no output. So. All right, so let's see. Um, so let's name the solver before we get going too far. There we go. Okay, open is 10 ticks to the EMA. So I always like to try and keep the names as short as I can. Otherwise these solvers can get pretty long. Um, all right, so let's see, we're gonna need another comparison solver here. And this comparison solver will make sure that the open price is uh, two ticks away from the EMA. Right, so we're gonna make sure that uh, we're a minimum of two ticks away 
from the EMA. Let's plug that in there. And let's set things up again. So we're again look using the open price. And let's go put our EMA 20 in there. EMA 20, like so. All right, and so now we're interested in two ticks. More than two ticks away. And so now, so we're, now we're going to use all the outputs, all the outputs except the A equals B. Right? And you notice how, it, again, it says A equals B within zero ticks, even though I have my large amount and small amount set to two ticks. So I can click off, click on another solver, click back, and now you can see my text has been updated. So A equals B within two ticks. We'll leave that at zero, and we're going to turn all the rest on, like so. All right. You'll notice, again, I'm, I'm setting these solvers up to generate a long output and a short output at the same time. Um, yeah, and that's because whatever this condition is, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know how this condition would be um, a long or a short output. So I'm just making a generic, a generic output that just identifies this this open price you know being within 10 ticks and away uh, and uh, two ticks away from an EMA 20 so I'm just kind of uh, setting these solvers up so they're, they're just kind of generic um, and just identifies that condition so let's um, let's name this solver here All right, so the open is two ticks from the EMA 20, like so. And last step, we need to combine these two solvers together. So we need to know when these two solvers are both true at the same time, like so, with an AND node. Okay, there we have it. Let me kind of zoom in here. Um, let's take a look here. So if we look at the open prices, right, that's within two, 10 ticks, that's within 10 ticks. The open of this bar, is within two ticks so therefore it's not identified right the open is too close to the EMA 20 so therefore it's not marked it's not identified and then our open price it's within 10 ticks but then our open price moves too far away so that open open of that bar is more than 10 ticks away from our EMA And yep, and then eventually our open price comes within 10 ticks of our EMA. So let's see what we have over here. Yeah, here we go. Here's another bar where the open is, looks like it's about a tick away. So it's within two ticks of that EMA. So therefore it is not marked. Yeah, and then over here, the open prices are too far away from our EMA. So. Okay, uh, let's see. That does it for that one. Um, yeah, let's say if we wanted to know, if we wanted to know 
whether the open price is above the EMA or below the EMA. We can do that as well. So um, I could do that. I can grab another uh, comparison solver to do that. And again, we'll set input A to our open price. And we're going to set input B to our EMA, 20 again. This time, uh, we're going to leave the large amount and small amount to zero ticks. And um, we're going to leave the outputs the way they are. Leave the D We're going to leave the outputs to on their default setting here. And so now we can see whether the when the open is above or below the EMA 20. So right there there are open it's just barely below that EMA 20. Uh, and then the open goes above it again and then the open goes below our EMA 20. All right? So I can take this and plug it in to the AND node, and then, then it kind of creates a directional kind of output there, right? So, so if we needed a directional output, I mean, there's just kind of an example of how you could do that. Um, so let's give this a name here before we go too far. So we'll this just checks to see if is the open above or below the EMA twenty. There, like so. All right, I'll leave this disconnected here because that that wasn't really a part of the question. So I'll leave that disconnected. King, how do you change the chart to a different color when using the time session solver? Um, Okay, so um, solvers don't change uh, the chart color, um, right? Um, yeah, let me kind of back up here. So, um, yeah, solvers don't uh, change the chart color. Um, you know, Bloodhound, Bloodhound has two outputs, right? Bloodhound's design to just provide simple, clear and simple signals to you. You know, a long, you know, a long state, a long signal, or a short state, you know, short signal. So you can see, right, so Bloodhound generates, you know, green or red. And of course, this Bloodhound's an indicator. So if you want, you can open up your indicators, go into Bloodhound, and you can change the colors to whatever you want. Right, so you can see there's a long, I mean, there's a long confidence and there's a short confidence. Long and short. So those are your long and short outputs there. And you can go in and change those colors just like you can with any indicator. So if you want your long to show up as blue instead of green, you know, you can go in here and change your color to blue. Whatever you like. Um, Right, so that that's those are the only colors that you can change here. Uh, so solvers themselves won't change um, won't change the plot color, right? So, um, and I yeah, I guess just to make note here, um, so I'll make a new logic template here so let's just throw a time solver on here just so we can see something and I'll, I'll I'm just gonna use a um, a custom session here from 10 to 12 And let's see, where is that on the chart? Um, there we go. 
All right. So you can see, so once again, time is non-directional. Time is just a condition, you know. It's this time or it's not this time. So it's non-directional. So the time solver, you know, it's going to output long and short at the same time, uh, right, because that to allow a long or a short trade during this time. Right, so the time solver has a long and a short output at the same time. So that way you can get both a long trade or a short trade during those times. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, the one thing you can do, um, you know, if you wanted to, you could change the evaluate from long only or short only. So if I want, I can put it on long only and therefore, um, right, I'm only getting a, a long output from that solver you know so I could paint the chart green in that aspect if that's you know if that's what your interest is you know or I can set it to short only and I could paint the chart red if I wanted to so right so there we go or I can put both on and then you get brown right green and red makes brown I'm sure you guys remember that from uh, elementary school, mixing your paints together. <laughs> so the way we made brown is we mixed uh, green and red. <laughs> so that's how we made dirt. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, Jack said I was he was watching a er, uh, a previous workshop, and I guess I was covering the time solver here. Um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, uh, you know, basically, yeah, if you're trying to use the time solver to kind of uh, mark your chart up, or to color your chart, um, and if you want to know when the market hours are, right, NinjaTrader has, these are all, you know, NinjaTrader uh, default time sessions. So if you want the you know the US regular trading hours, you can just use this one, <clears throat> right? It goes from 9.30 to 4 um, Eastern time. All right, and that would so the solver, the time solver would would um, you know paint your chart during the market hours there. Um, or of course you can create your own custom time session. So all these ones that have an underscore, you know, those are custom custom uh, session templates, you know, that have been built in in past past workshops there. Uh, right. So if we want to build your own, uh, you know, this is this is NinjaTrader's session manager. Right. If you take a look at this, you'll see it's the exact same thing as let me get to the control center. All right, so here's Ninja's control center. So if we go to tools, right there, session manager. All right, exact same thing, the session manager. Um, all right, so you can use session Ninja Trader's session manager to make your own custom session, you know, or times. So basically, a session is a, a block of time. Um, right, so you can make your own. All right, there's a new button there, so you can click new and you can make your own and then save it. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. The other thing we have available um, is um, let's see. There's also a indicator that was added to Bloodhound, um, I'm guessing about a year ago. It's a fairly new indicator. This time block indicator here. So there's there's similar indicators up on uh, on NinjaTraders um, download area and NinjaTraders you know support download area uh, indicator download area and also up on Futures I O. You know there's similar indicators like this time block one you know if you're just interested in coloring your chart um, 
but you can see here we have three different colors that you can apply uh, to the chart if you want right so from 930 to 4 so I have my start time and end time during the market hours Eastern right this is Eastern time um, <clears throat> Right, so you'll need to uh, adjust this to your time zone. Uh, you know, if you're if you're not on Eastern time zone, you might want to you'll want to adjust these here. Um, but just to show you, right, we can put so this it's going to color my chart yellow, silver, and this uh, purple thistle. So there's another way to color the chart. Right, so there we go. So there's yellow. And then it's going to switch over to gray. So there's gray during the market hours. And uh, let's see, market hasn't closed yet, so we didn't get into the purple. Let's go let's go to yesterday. There we go. So there's gray and and the, hmm. yeah, the gray and that thistle <laughs> look look pretty similar. <clears throat> so um, that's weird. I'm really getting some odd colors for some reason like this yellow is really really dark yellow I'm not sure looks like something else is affecting the coloring on my chart <clears throat> so I'm not sure why that yellow is so dark it shouldn't be so dark but oh. you know so let's say I want to take the uh, in between the start and the end time and turn that off I can do that <clears throat> all right let's try another color see if that fixes it oh, there we go there we go now we can tell the difference between the gray and the purple there there we go all right uh, let me see if there's any other questions here I do have a screenshot here I'll share with you guys just sounds like uh, for some reason Jeff is just uh, having some problems um, with uh, his with I guess with some multi time frame chart data. All right. Well, I don't know exactly what bar settings uh, are being used in this screenshot here, but we'll take a stab at it. Um, all right, so I need to change my bars um, to, let's see, yeah, he's using the Unirankos, okay. I think he's using a, a tick trend of three, and I guess let's, we'll knock the reversal down to ten, I guess. Um, all right, I don't know what the open would be. So, um, okay. just a moment here. Let me clear off this time block indicator. There we go. Actually, this is a multi time, multi time frame question. So, I'm, I'm, I'll need to pull up two charts here. So I'm going to set, since Bloodhound, Bloodhound is on this chart, I'm going to set this to the lower time frame chart, which is going to be a tick trend of two. And uh, I guess we'll set a reversal of eight. All right. And there. All right, let's pull up another chart. This will be our higher time frame chart. So let me get this set up. All 
Okay, so we have a higher time frame, Renko chart, um, Unirenko chart, and we have a lower time frame. And let's get our global crosshairs going here. There. And so I need to find a spot on the chart here. All right, so what, let's see, what Jeff would like to do is, he's wanting to, well, he's wanting to ignore a bar in the wrong direction here. And, um, all right, I need to make this so it can be seen on the other chart. Oh, no wonder, this is not the end queue. All right, let's switch this over to the end queue. Uh, there we go. All right, there we go. So we can see the red um, rectangle on both charts now. Um, all right, so we, we can see on the higher time frame, on the, uh, shoot. <laughs> Good old, uh, good old global crosshairs. Um, all right, so on the higher time frame chart, uh, we can see that we're working with uh, the higher time frame chart has some, uh, it has down bars. So if the higher time frame chart has down bars, um, Jeff wants to ignore, um, he's, he's looking at the bar direction, so he wants to ignore, you know, on the lower time frame, he wants to ignore any kind of bars in the wrong direction. Uh, r so, really, um, what it all boils down to is Jeff just simply wants to see the bar direction of the higher time frame imposed on the lower time frame here. That's simply what it all kind of boils down to. So, um, yeah. So let's, uh, let's set that up in Bloodhound here. So it's been a while since I've had any uh, multi-time frame questions. So uh, we're gonna work on the solver tab and we're going to add a chart, right? So we're going to add a chart time frame here. And we're going to change it from the minute. Let's change it to the Unirenko. And I'll set this up to match my black chart there. So it's 3, 10, and 4. Yeah. There we go. All right, so we have a um, a another chart time frame in in Bloodhound, and simply what Jeff is looking for is to to see the bar direction from there. So I'll just put a bar direction on this time frame here, and let's go make a. Um, so let's go make another logic template here. So this is going to be the higher time frame um, bar direction. All right. So let's go to our, our solver nodes. And under existing nodes, you'll see that there's two time frames now, right? So we have the default time frame, uh, right, which has all the previous solvers we built during this workshop. And now we have this other uh, chart time frame here with the bar direction solver on it. So we'll go put this one on the board and connect it up. And there we go. <coughs> now, you'll notice nothing's happening here. And we have a message that says press F5 so we can update Bloodhound. So, um, right, so whenever you add. Uh, chart data to your system, 
Ninja Trader cannot create that chart data on the fly. You, um, you uh, Ninja Trader needs a refresh to do that. So what we'll do is we go to go to this chart and we just uh, do a reload, and that will that will uh, that's what Ninja Trader needs in order to build that chart data. Um, and uh, so there we go. Now we can see the higher time frame bar direction. All right, so over here, and keep in mind the global crosshairs, you know, don't aren't aren't perfect here. So if you look at my global crosshairs, you'll see I have my crosshairs on this up bar. You can see on my higher time frame chart, it's actually marking the down the down bar. So, um, yeah, I mean, thing I don't know these global crosshairs aren't perfect, but they get you in the ballpark, right? So, um, so we can see here um, on on the white chart, which is our lower time frame. When this bar closes, this bar, so this bar in the lower time frame has closed after, has closed after this bar on the higher time frame. And this bar, this bar on the lower time frame, right, on my white chart, this bar closed, it closed before the higher time frame bar closed. <clears throat> right? So my black arrow, this bar, it has closed, it closed before this bar closed. And that's why Bloodhound is giving us a, a, a long bar direction. Right? So, so as far as Bloodhound knows, you know, the higher time frame bar, it hasn't closed yet, so it hasn't created a down bar yet. Right. So we have to wait for this next bar to close, and then the higher time frame bar closes and it creates a down bar. So, right. So that could be, uh, that's, that's usually the, the trickiest thing to understand when someone starts working with multiple time frames you know is that they're they're expecting you know this bar to identify you know the higher time frame as a down bar but the down bar hasn't closed yet so it all comes down to the timing you know so what you see you know on your charts uh, can be a little misleading sometimes unless you start actually looking at the timing of the bars and stuff. So, all right. So, um, yeah, there we go. That was essentially Jeff's question. It was just that easy. So, um. <clears throat> all right. So, let me see. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read. Through uh, this email is a little lengthy. It's a little bit of going back and forth with Mike. So I'm going to see if there's anything else in this email here that I can address for Jeff. So just a moment while I read through this. So reading a little further up the email here, uh, I found the bar settings. So let me just make some subtle adjustments here. Not that changing the changing the the bar settings isn't going to make a difference, but uh, just to get them synced up. Okay, and let's see the higher time frame. We have a reversal of twenty one and an open offset of twelve. <clears throat> All right, let's close that. And of course, we're gonna have to refresh the chart again since I 
changed the higher time frame settings. So we'll refresh the chart. And then let's go to our our higher time frame chart here and plug in the same settings. Okay. <clears throat> And I'm going to change the mode to all or nothing. There we go. Okay, I just need to kind of scan through the chart and so I get a better understanding of what, what might be going on here. All right. So, uh, yeah, it looks like... Um, Based on the timing of these bars, uh, there. All right. Yeah, so I have my cursor on. Let's grab this white arrow. So I'm, gonna, I'm putting my cursor on this up bar here, this reversal bar. Right, this reversal up bar and um, when I look at the white chart I can see that the cursor lines up on the fourth up bar all right let me put some drawing aids on here all right so we have one two, three, four. All right. So putting my cursor back on the higher time frame chart, the black chart. So put my cursor on this reversal up bar here. I can see it, it, it marks the fourth up bar on the lower time frame chart, right? The lower time frame chart. And so Jeff wants to generate a, a long output on the third, again, on the third up bar on the lower time frame chart. So again, this, the, ah, come on. So the third bar here is key. So, you know, I don't think we have to do anything sophisticated here I think you know the way this is all playing out because it's so simple um, I think realistically we can just put oh uh, wait 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 um, no yeah no that's not gonna work um, yeah, it wasn't quite that simple okay so what I will use is um, I'm gonna use the if then Let's see. Yeah. I'm going to use the if then. And so the lower time frame is going to control the if then. So let's move our lower time frame up and I'll drop the higher time frame solver down. Okay. So there you go. So there's right there's the bar direction for the lower time frame 
And remember, this bar direction is set to look for three, three bars. And it's looking for three bars in the same direction. All right? The higher time frame solver, it's only looking for one bar. So it's only looking for just, it's just looking at just one bar. Just, yeah, just the single bar's direction. And um, so the only thing we need to do is, um, so these white areas, right, these areas where there is no output, we just need to fill those in with the higher time frame bar direction. Right, so here we go. So these two bars need to be filled in with the higher time frame bar direction, right? And over here, these white areas need to be filled in with the higher time frame bar direction. Seems like that's what it's coming down to. And to do that, we can plug this guy into the else. And hmm, that's not quite working either. Oh, right, 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 right. Sorry. Um, yeah. There's always one little. It's always this little detail here. So, um, so this solver is basically controlling the switch, uh, the if then switch. But we want this. Right, so uh, you know, the thing to know about the if then is that there's two switches in it. There's a switch for the long output and there's a switch for the short output. Right? And so we want the switch for the long and the short output to both be moving, to both be switching in uh, together, in unison together here. So the way I can do that, um, the way I can do that is I need a long short modifier. So let's take a look at the long short modifier. And um, right, so when for this the, from this bar direction solver, when I get an output, I want to get both a long and a short output. So when I get a long and a short output, it controls both the long switch and the short switch inside of this if then. And I can use the I can use this modifier to create a long and a short output at the same time. And I'm going to use addition mode. Addition mode. So I'll just rename the solver to addition because that's what it's doing. Okay. So now when we look at the chart, right, whenever we get three bars in the same direction we get a long and a short at the same time and that's what we need uh, for this case that's what we need to control this if then so let's plug that into the if and take a look at the output here all right and then let's take this and plug it into then and now we can take a higher time frame bar direction solver and plug it into the else. And there we go. Now we have it. All right, so the, the higher time frame basically, um, well, no, we, we get three down bars in a row. So the lower time frame solver. So remember our lower time frame solver over here. It is printing, but then when we get a reversal bar, so when we get a reversal bar, we have to wait for three, three bars in the same direction um, before before the solver starts to print. Right, so the first, these first two bars, right, that output 
that output is going to be coming from the higher time frame. All right, I think that does it for this question as far as I understand it. Thank you.